welcome to our continuous series of virtual voices. Thank you for your letters and your comments. We are very pleased to welcome today Mr. Andrew Baird, who is the CEO of Education for Employment and the founder of the Global Center for Youth Employment. Our moderator is Professor Mark Robson, faculty member at Rutgers University in New Jersey, who has been on our board for many, many years. Over to you, Mark. Thank you, Dr. Derbach, and welcome to all of you. As always, it's a great joy to have you join us today. And it's a special privilege for me to get to introduce our presenter. As you know, normally it's Oprah, who is, of course is much more articulate and much more efficient, but today I get to do it. And I get to introduce my colleague and friend, Andrew Baird. And Andrew comes to us in, with a wealth of experience. He's currently the president and CEO of Education for Employment Network, which he's going to describe for us. But my first interaction with Andrew was both in Liberia and in the Philippines, because for many years, he was in charge of the Employment Workforce Development Group at RTI. And that, of course, as you know, is the largest nonprofit in the United States. Andrew led a group of about 130 folks and had a portfolio of projects totaling in excess of $150 million. Andrew is an extraordinary person who has great compassion and warmth and empathy for folks throughout the developing world. Uh, in addition to his uh, educational background at the College of Worcester and later graduate training at the Johns Hopkins School for Advanced International Studies, Andrew also spent some time in the Peace Corps in Cameroon. And so that he shares in common with our moderator, Fred. So Andrew comes to us with a wide range of experiences. What he's doing today is really exciting. It's groundbreaking. And I'm just delighted to introduce to you my colleague and friend, Mr. Andrew Baird. Well, thank you, Mark. And uh, Dr. Durbach, thank you so much for, uh, for inviting me. I'm uh, looking forward to this conversation and um, we'll provide uh, a bit of an overview of, of education for employment, as Mark said. It was a nice surprise to get the email yesterday from Mark saying that he'd be uh, introducing me. Uh, it's, uh, it's great to connect with uh, good friends and colleagues here in, uh, in this time where connections are so precious. Um, so thank you all for, uh, for tuning in today. And um, I'm really hoping to leave uh, enough time or probably a good bit of time for, uh, for questions um, and have more of a dialogue here. So let me start by giving you a little bit of uh, the background of EFE. And I'm gonna go ahead and share a presentation here uh, with you. Um, I'm hoping you can all see that now. Uh, thumbs up. Great. So we start with this premise that we believe that talent is universal, but opportunities are not. And that's really kind of a core tenet of, of what we believe. I'm going to start with a little bit of context. EFE focuses in the MENA region, Middle East and, and North Africa. And I'll give a little bit of detail about uh, how that came about. But the MENA region is the region that has the highest youth unemployment rate in the world, higher than Asia, higher than Africa. And there are a number of both economic and cultural reasons for that. And we can talk a little bit about that. The unemployment rates officially, uh, according to the ILO, uh, is 17% for, for men on average and twice as high for women, about 35%. The real unemployment rate, however, is probably almost double that. Um, and so it's a, it's a very significant amount. 5 million jobs need to be created in the region just over the next five years, just to maintain the current level of unemployment. So it's, a, it's an incredibly uh, daunting task. And another interesting uh, um, phenomena is that the highest demographic of unemployed youth in the region are those with a university or college degree. 
So as we like to say, nothing guarantees you unemployment in the MENA region like a university degree. And again, there are many cultural reasons and some structural reasons for this. And one last uh, statistic here, 17.5% uh, of women in the MENA region are actually in the labor force. So an enormous uh, number of women are not in the labor force and not looking uh, for work. So great loss potential there. So who we are, very briefly, our mission is to create economic opportunities for unemployed youth. Um, we, uh, we focus uh, initially um, organizationally on those university and college uh, graduate youth, but have expanded over time to include youth who have uh, secondary degrees and uh, technical and vocational degrees uh, as well. We separate ourselves kind of, I think, from many other organizations that are doing um, uh, work with youth and training in that our metric, our key metric is not how many youth are trained, but how many youth are employed at the end of our programs. So we start with a very demand-driven market-led approach, understanding the labor market in each country, becoming familiar with who is hiring in what sectors, and making sure that our training is focused uh, on those uh, sectors. Uh, very quickly, um, these are the countries where we're currently operating in Morocco, Algeria, Tunisia, and North Africa, and Egypt, Jordan, Palestine, uh, and Gaza, Saudi Arabia, UAE, and Yemen. And the way we're structured as a network is that the, the US office is referred to as our global office, and each country has its own affiliate, which is an independently organized and registered organization. Each has its own board. One of the benefits of my job is I get to sit in on uh, about 40 board meetings a year. Um, <laughs> I don't recommend it, uh, but uh, it's, um, it, it is a very unique structure in that regard. The boards in each country are really composed of some of the movers and shakers in the business community um, and provide great access and entree into uh, the labor market. Uh, so we found it to be a very successful model. Very quickly, just to kind of give uh, a bit of scale, we began our first graduating class uh, in 2006. Uh, 12 um, youth in Gaza who were trained to, to be uh, in the accounting sector and were hired immediately by CCC Construction. It's the third largest construction company in the world. Um, its founder uh, was one of the board members uh, of uh, our affiliate uh, in, um, in Gaza and, uh, and uh, Palestine West Bank. Um, and from there, from those modest beginnings in 2006, we have now graduated uh, 112,000 uh, alumni, 56% um, of whom are women. And we're very proud of the fact that uh, we have a greater percentage of women uh, graduates even than um, men. So very quickly, some of the things that, uh, that we feel um, are required in order to kind of move from unemployed to employed in addition to that is this awareness of how to find and identify opportunities. So that's one of the focal points. Um, the mindset uh, and expectations. So often expectations are far out of a line. For example, I think this is one of the drivers of the unemployment rate for university and, and college degreed uh, youth in the Middle East. Um, historically, and this is not exclusive to this region, historically, uh, government jobs were considered the jobs that people wanted to get. They were stable, uh, guaranteed income. Once you had them, they were hard to lose. Um, and so as the government began to uh, shrink its workforce, um, those jobs became harder to find. Uh, and so there became a bit of a mismatch in terms of what universities and colleges were training 
uh, and educating for. Um, and so getting the expectations in line is, a, is something that we work on. Far and away when we survey the employers uh, and looking at what their needs are, the single biggest factor is uh, that they say are, is missing in the labor force are these soft skills. I like to call them essential skills. Um, they're the communication skills, teamwork skills, um, how to be innovative, uh, all of the kinds of things which really make you um, a strong and productive um, member of the, the workforce and an organization. Um, so those are the areas that we focus uh, a lot on are kind of those, again, uh, what I like to call essential skills. Who are they? I've just taken a couple of screenshots. This is screenshots this morning from our monitoring system. Um, applicants this year, 2020, and I'm going to get into kind of why this year is a little special for obvious reasons. Um, but you can see that uh, kind of 21, 22, 23 years old is the the sweet spot for applicants. We have you know applicants that go up to uh, to 40 years old. Um, we try to limit uh, to about 30, 32 years of age is where we like to have kind of the cutoff for most of our programs, but uh, we do make exceptions. Again, another screenshot uh, from uh, our monitoring system today. When applying for the programs, we ask them what their motivation is for doing it. Um, and by far, 40% uh, say their top motivation is to improve their professional skills. But there's a whole host of other uh, skills or reasons that drive them. Um, and so we really try to, to cater to a broad range uh, of meeting the needs of, uh, of the youth based on their motivations. And here's another kind of interesting one, the, what they perceive to be the biggest impediment to finding uh, a job on the local labor market. Um, the number one uh, ranked uh, here is a lack of job opportunities in the market, um, followed closely by the discovery that what they studied really wasn't relevant to what jobs were available. So there is this mismatch between what is being taught in the educational institutions and what is being required in the labor market. So real quickly, our training programs. We have three tracks. The primary track is our job placement and training. And so this is tends to be a bit of a longer training period. It can be um, longer in quotes, uh, three weeks, probably minimal to six months, depending on how much technical training. And so this might be training that involves computer literacy, sometimes English literacy, as well as all of the work uh, place readiness types of uh, softer skills or essential skills. Uh, it could be in sectors such as auto mechanics. And again, we start with the market demand. So we do not bring youth together for training unless we know there's a job waiting for them on the other end. So we go to the market, we have a network and we'll talk about this of about 3000 employer partners around the region. More and more they come to us and they say we have the need for 15 people in such and such a sector. And then we would recruit youth that have some predisposition to that sector, provide the, the, that bridge training um, and what we try to do is get a guarantee of an interview for those youth. Sometimes we can get a guarantee of the job. That takes a little bit more to, to develop that relationship. But if we can guarantee an interview, what we have found is that between 70 and 80% of the time, the youth who have gone through our programs are selected to be hired. We have about a 78% job placement rate for those youth who go through our job training and placement program within six months, which is, uh, I think, um, a pretty, pretty remarkable uh, statistic. A second program we have is our pathways to a job. And this is really focused more on people who may still be um, 
in uh, educational institutions, whether it's secondary uh, or tertiary. And it's really the job hunting skills. How do you find a job? How do you identify the sector? What, how do you write your CV? Uh, how do you interview? Um, public speaking. So all of those skills that would give them a leg up uh, when they do enter the labor market. So this is a bit of a lighter touch um, program. And then the third track is entrepreneurship. And this is one that will probably come as no surprise is uh, in the time of COVID, uh, having more and more focus as there are fewer jobs and people are not hiring. Um, the response from a lot of governments is, well, we need to promote more entrepreneurship, which is great. I concur with that as long as those same governments that are promoting the entrepreneurship are also promoting an enabling environment and policies within their country that will be conducive to succeeding uh, in, uh, in their enterprises. And those could be access to finance, it could be things like bankruptcy laws, which in the Middle East have tended to really discourage people from starting businesses. Um, it could be, uh, you know, a whole host of kind of policy initiatives that need to, to go. So we, we work on the advocacy and policy uh, around that as well. So I've described this a little bit, but just so it's on one page, we identify the needs, we design a course that meets those and recruit screen applicants. We set up interviews, um, conduct the, the, uh, the training itself, um, and hopefully youth are then hired um, by those who started the process by explaining what their needs are. So again, um, some of our, uh, our, our three programs, uh, finding a job is a job and uh, the workplace success. Um, we do a lot of work in competencies. I won't go into too much detail there, but one of the things that we work with our um, employer partners is to really understand the competencies for these entry level jobs. And we focus on first job because the literature has shown that the trajectory that one takes by getting your first job early uh, has a really big impact on where you end up. So we really focus on getting people that first job. And I, I mentioned the employer partners. Um, they are a whole host uh, of organizations um, that uh, are both national and international. This is kind of our international ones. I have another slide that does um, national ones. All right, going to take a breath. That's, that's um, a bit of an overview of who we are and, and how, we, uh, how we operate. March 2020, COVID, suddenly everything changed. So our in-person training, and that's kind of been one of our hallmarks, is, is having trainings that are in-person and really uh, leveraging the human relationships and understanding, um, uh, you know, teamwork and all of those things that's very hard to do remotely. That stopped. The market side, hiring stopped. And youth applications to programs stopped. So we kind of suddenly for a couple of weeks felt like we were at a dead stop. What did we do? Well, Originally, our response was, we have about a million social media followers around our network. Egypt alone has about 400,000 uh, youth who follow uh, their Facebook page. So given how much misinformation, if you recall all of the misinformation, one of my favorites was um, smokers were immune to COVID. Um, that what was going around Morocco and, uh, and Egypt, um, that it was a hoax. Uh, all of the different uh, misinformation that was out there. We felt like we had a platform to be able to promote reliable, good information that was coming out. So uh, we started to do that both with our, um, our youth, um, but also with the employer partners 
to help them be able to spread the word among their employees and staff. In Palestine, we already had a program that uh, worked with training healthcare professionals, nurses in particular. And so we quickly adapted um, information that was being developed on care for, um, for COVID patients and began to, to do training there. In Tunisia, we entered into a partnership with uh, the, um, the Ministry of Health and their uh, services, and we developed a training curricula for doctors. We certified 500 doctors in COVID care. And this was all online training that had uh, a series of instructional videos on you know, things like intubation. So a lot of it was um, things which doctors may have been taught and not used. Um, and so it was refresher. Uh, and then there were some, some new things and protocols around COVID. And then uh, in Yemen, for example, um, there was a door-to-door -door campaign because information is so difficult to get out. It was a social distance door-to-door -door campaign, uh, but door-to-door -door nonetheless that our staff and youth um, and alumni engaged in, uh, in, in Yemen. The second thing we did was that we recognized that we needed to be moving more towards an online approach. So we developed our own learning management system and digitized our curricula. We have blended as well. So we have synchronous and asynchronous uh, capability for, uh, for training now. Each country, and this is the Saudi Arabia uh, landing page, each country has its own portal to the, uh, the learning management system um, and is able to uh, adapt the titles to their own specific needs, add curriculum, which is specific uh, to their country um, and is, an avail is available uh, our curriculum in, in Arabic, French, uh, and in English. So each country now uh, has that capability. <clears throat> we conducted a survey in June and July of 150 of our employer partners in three different countries kind of understand what the impact on the labor market, which really, again, drives our approach was going to be or had been. And I'm just gonna give you a, a little, little overview of some of the findings here. So not surprisingly, a significant portion of the businesses were negatively impacted through reduced demand, um, shutdowns that, that were required uh, by governments. Um, only 13% reported that COVID had not uh, negatively impacted um, their business. And another 13 actually said that it had increased. And so these were things like logistics and delivery and the things that we've seen here, I think, uh, as well. Again, very similar to uh, other places in the world, there was a very dramatic shift towards teleworking. Um, we, uh, we asked, um, you know, what percentage of the staff were actually teleworking. 32% uh, said basically 100% of their staff, um, but others had it kind of very graded between um, uh, less than 10 and 90%. So it was not uniform by any means. Uh, so there was still some uh, going on uh, in the office settings. 56% um, said that they have not reduced uh, their staff, which we, thought was uh, a pretty good finding. Um, but from those who did, it was fairly uh, dramatic. Um, these were the sectors that were most impacted. Again, probably no surprises here. Hospitality, uh, advertising, restaurants, et cetera. Um, those that had almost no impact, uh, engineering, pharmaceuticals, oil, gas, uh, et cetera. So this is the uh, kind of magnitude. Um, so of those who said that they reduced staff, on average, 35% of their staff uh, were, uh, were reduced, which is obviously pretty significant. And when you look at it and the numbers, average number of employees, 175 pre-COVID, 
uh, 122 post COVID. Here's the biggest takeaway. Women were impacted at three to four times the rate than that of men. So in a region where women already had extremely high uh, unemployment rates, they were negatively impacted three to four times than the rate of men. And again, if you go back and you look at the sectors, you can kind of see why. Hospitality, restaurants, catering, et cetera, teaching. So this is kind of where we have begun to put our emphasis over the next period of time is how to mitigate that impact with women. Um, and there's a number of ways we can do that. Maybe that can be part of the, uh, the discussion later. Um, good news here marginally is that surveyed and asked about rehiring before the end of the year or early in 2021. Um, most said that they would, the numbers were not dramatic. Um, so it's a slow recovery. Um, and then I'll just end kind of the COVID here. One of the questions we asked was about returning. We wanted to see the awareness that they had about uh, protective measures. And I think we were pleased to find that most employers, small and large alike, um, recognized that they needed to take uh, measures to protect staff when they return to the, uh, to the workplace eventually. So our current situation, Good news is training is back to pre-COVID levels. Our movement to the online training uh, environment has, uh, has worked very quickly. Um, a side benefit is that we, because we did in-person training, the youth were restricted by those who could actually physically come to the training site. Now, because it's online training. Anyone who has enough of an internet capability can participate. And so we've been able to expand our reach uh, into some of the more difficult um, areas uh, to reach in the country, which is good. Um, we've reduced the cost of delivery for sure. We haven't had enough time to assess the impact of that. And so, you know, are we able to produce the same kind of quality uh, results in learning um, remotely that we have in person, the jury's out. Job training or job placements still challenging, um, but again, we're recognizing what sectors that have some growth potential at this point, and we're moving towards that. Um, and again, being able to innovate in delivery. I want to real quickly show you just a, a video or two, because I think as much as I can say, the alumni uh, themselves um, are much more capable uh, of doing that. And so if you'll indulge me just a moment, I will give you a bit of a, let's see. All right, can we see the new screen? And in Morocco, education doesn't necessarily mean opportunity. I spent five years earning my bachelor's and master's degrees in financial engineering. I dreamed of a job in cost control, but I've been looking for work since 2017. You finish school full of hope, but each month you are unemployed, the more it disappears. It was a dark time that forced me to really question myself. Even though very few women here work in tech, I've always been interested in it. I could see that there were lots of IT jobs, but unit skills that I didn't have, and I couldn't afford another degree. Then I found out about education for employment job in tech training for people who don't have a tech background. The training is completely different from any class I've ever taken because it's so practical and interactive. I'm not just learning programming. I'm also learning soft skills that employers want, like communication and teamwork. 
The most important part is that EAG has employment partnerships with five of the leading IT companies. So we all know that when we finish, there are real jobs available. I can already see myself overseeing software systems and earning a steady salary. During my unemployed days, I could never have imagined feeling so optimistic about my future. AMP has been my second chance in life, and I can't wait to start my new job. And um, I'm going to show you one more. Do you see a dark screen now? I want to make sure it transferred. OK. This is one of my favorite uh, uh, alumni. I'll tell you a little bit about her uh, after the video. Here, I think I can. Um, hello, Where I am come from in Egypt, no one thinks that, that women can be technicians. Of the resilience theory. Sorry, I am Dima Nedo, and two I videos will be going at the same time. For this session. Today, we will be discussing jobs and philanthropy uh, in Galina's COVID recovery with a panel of right. business leaders and EFE partners and board members. Let me start by introducing our guest speakers today. How do we? On the panel, uh, we welcome Rami Turki. Uh, Rami is the president and CEO <laughs> of the Turkey Holding. Rami also is a founder mm -hmm. and so member of the advisory board uh, for Saudi Arabia, EFE Saudi Arabia. All right, sorry about that. It's YouTube just jumped right to the next video. So, all right, now we can go back to. All right, are we back on the video? All right, apologies. Where I am come from in Egypt, no one thinks that women can be technicians, especially someone who works on an oil and gas rig for months at a time. Too many people think that women were created only to stay at home and raise the children. But my parents believed in me, and I was very lucky to be hired by Shambhaji, where they really value women employees. When I first started on the gas rig, all of my colleagues were men. I had to work twice as hard to prove to them that I was strong enough. Now they say they hope their sisters and daughters will be like me. It makes me so proud to be changing their minds. When I was unemployed, I felt like a bird that couldn't fly. When you have a job, you can dream. This is why I am excited to be an EFE graduate through the Schlumberger Technician Training Program. And I am honored to be a woman ambassador in the EFE program. I wanted to tell the world that women deserve an opportunity to prove themselves. And I wanted to tell women they should take this chance because it will change their lives and it changed mine. <laughs> All right. So, Aya, when I spoke to Aya and first met her, I asked her about her first day on the job. And she told me that she was one of three women in a, a, a site that had 8,000 men. And uh, she said she was a little overwhelmed. And then she realized how easy it was going to be her, for her to find a husband. <laughs> so, and, and as it turns out, she did. Um, but she has moved up through the organization and has done uh, extremely well. So anyway, it's always nice to have a little bit of a human uh, touch there uh, to, to put some, some faces into the, the, the numbers. So I'll end there and turn it over back to Mark. So oh, thank you, Andrew, so much for that thoughtful and insightful presentation. I certainly 
learned a lot and value very much what you're doing in a place that's quite a hard place to work, but you've been able to adapt even under these remarkable times with COVID. And some of the questions that we're going to ask you from our audience uh, are going to ask you about that. But I wanna ask you a question up front as the old college professor who uh, trains a lot of the young people that are on the screen today and who are like our students all over the world. When you hire folks, uh, when you look to bring someone into EFE, not uh, when you assist them to find work in country, but when you're ready to recruit young women and men to join your organization, what, if, if you had a chance to see them on the front end when they're sophomores or juniors, what kinds of courses would you say would be good for them to have on their transcript, in their portfolio? What kinds of uh, work experiences or internships uh, would be helpful when you're evaluating someone to bring on the team? Yeah, no, it's a great question, Mark. And I'll, and I'll start um, with the, uh, the kind of experience and then maybe move to the, to the courses. So I would say um, having some experience uh, in a cross-cultural experience, whether that's abroad or, or at home, but uh, a demonstration of that ability uh, and love for working uh, across cultures. Um, specifically with EFE, uh, we obviously uh, look for people who have a, an interest and maybe some experience in the, in the region, um, but uh, if not that, at least uh, a propensity to, to be able to work in that, that kind of an environment. Um, you know, I think uh, the, the language um, ability is uh, another one. Um, that's a big door opener, whether it's uh, French or Arabic or uh, just a, a demonstration that one uh, has the ability to, to learn a language um, and the interest in, in taking that on. So that's um, something else. And in terms of, of coursework, I, I think um, it really ranges because although we're a relatively small organization, we have uh, people that do project management um, and uh, we have people who um, are on the IT side, the training side. Um, so I think courses that would prepare for those uh, areas um, are ones that we, we look for. Um, certainly uh, IT skills, but I would say writing skills, um, demonstrating the ability to, to be able to write and, and write succinctly and, and well is probably a, one of the most critical. Thank you. And I think you know that those practical skills are so important in any employment, but clearly in a, in a multicultural, multinational company like your own. And in a number of the uh, folks who are on the program today have participated in the WIT internships that Dr. Durbach has put together where she really does emphasize the students uh, that they go to meetings at the UN and they get to witness a wide range of opinion from a wide range of uh, perspectives or from around the globe all in one place as well as write. My daughter was one of Dr. Durbach's interns and, and she said, dad we write a lot but I, I told her there's no substitute for being a, a good writer and a skilled writer, and that only comes with time. So let me ask you some of the questions from our audience now. Oh, uh, wait, I have uh, a question. But, yes, Dr. Durbach. Okay. Uh, first of all, thank you very much for a very interesting presentation. Uh, I have a question for you. What are your requirements, or do you have requirements for the countries and the governments that you set the EFE programs in? What are their responsibilities and to what extent do you demand an enabling requirement and how much of an enabling requirement do you require? Also, do you promote cultural changes? Like uh, actually one of your uh, students said that you know women are supposed to just uh, uh, stay home and make babies. Right. So to what extent are you focusing on that? Because that is something that I, I am particularly very interested in, both yeah. of these questions. <laughs> okay, well, great. So 
early on in EFE's development, I think the decision was taken that rather than approach entry into the countries through the government, we would approach through the private sector. If we could develop relationships with the government, great. And we've continued to, to do that and in some countries more than others. But the, the board, which really facilitated the entry and the registration of education for employment as uh, a legal entity in their country are by and large, not exclusively, but by and large private sector. Um, there are some exceptions. The, the Minister of Labor uh, in Jordan um, is the board chair or was actually a board chair until recently uh, in Jordan. Um, so we do have those, uh, those connections and, and uh, we, we work to develop them. Um, because I think a longer term goal is systems change. And by, by that, I mean, EFE serves this kind of labor market intermediation function that shouldn't need to exist. If educational institutions were um, uh, able to adapt and adopt the types of programs that we're providing, and there's a greater communication. And, and Mark and I have seen this in action in the Philippines and in Liberia and El Salvador and other places where uh, we've had the chance to work together. It's not exclusive to this region and it's, it's you know worldwide phenomena, this kind of disconnect. But so we're, we're the connector. Um, and, uh, but ultimately if, if ministries of education require the types of training and, and, and skill development that we provide in the secondary schools, then, you know, our job is made much easier. And uh, go on. Yeah, you know, and, and just to the second part of your question on the, the cultural exchange, we don't do the exchange part. We have partnered with some organizations to help identify youth to participate um, on, on those exchange programs. But what we do is we have launched um, campaigns within countries to try to change the way people think about a particular sector, for example. So women in hospitality in the Middle East can be very difficult. Um, and so trying to change the mindset of women and more importantly, their families, their fathers, their brothers, their uncles, how they see women working in that hospitality sector. So we've done a lot of that for different sectors. So basically the focus has to be more on enabling women by encouraging themselves to stop being baby factories, but actually uh, doing some productive work, whether it's manufacturing or ICT or uh, other areas, or so, like the woman that you showed who went on the rig, that it was very yeah. impressive. <laughs> Yeah, I would say that that there's a lot of societal pressure on women not to work in particular sectors for a variety of reasons. So in the hospitality sector, as I mentioned, it's because they ha would have to come in contact with men. And even worse, they serve alcohol in the hotels and, and restaurants, and it would not be seen um, positively by the community that the woman comes from to be in that environment, right? So these are cultural norms that exist that may not reflect reality, but, that, but they're there. And so there's a, there's a lot of pressure um, there. So it's not necessarily a, a choice uh, that women feel that they have. So we work a lot on helping to, to empower, um, and I, I hesitate to use that word empower because it feels like we have it to give, we don't. Um, it's really about uh, a woman's agency um, and uh, being a a allowing, creating the environment for her to exercise that. Thank you. Over to you, Mark. So uh, we have some interesting questions and you might notice from the Cyrillic that you see on the screen that we have a number of people from Ukraine. So I'm going to blend two questions together. The first one is, can you tell us how long EFE has been around? And of course, when are you going to the Ukraine? That's the, yeah. so we'll blend those two. Okay, so 2006 is when we graduated our first uh, uh, group. So we've been around that long. Um, and we, um, we always looked very 
um, carefully at when we begin when we expand into new countries. So as you've noticed, it's been limited thus far to the MENA region. Um, we feel like we have a choice of going broad or deep at this point. And we think that we have a lot more depth that we can attain within the countries. So more, most of our focus is on, on that. That said, when we look at entering a new country, one of the biggest factors is that private sector support. So is there a, a group of usually two or three people who say, senior business people um, uh, who say, this is a great idea. Uh, we're willing to promote this and put some resources behind it. So the way our founder, Ron Bruder, has typically um, done this is putting up half of the capital to be able to start a new affiliate and get that capital matched locally by local business people. Uh, and then it becomes a self-sustaining um, organization uh, at that point. So all of our affiliates are financially self-sufficient. So That's another question that was asked, um, it sort of follows along what you're doing presently is that what person wants to know, how were you able to actually continue the training during the COVID-19 crisis? And I'm assuming they mean more than just the fact that it was offered online. I, I think they probably want to know a little bit about the logistics that had to happen to make the, to allow continuity. Yeah. So uh, there were, there were two aspects. So the continuity aspect was th those who were actually enrolled in training and participating at the time that COVID stopped everything. Um, it was very challenging. And so uh, we used Zoom uh, and team meetings, uh, um, meetings and, um, and other uh, online platforms to be able to deliver training, probably not the most effectively at that point, but at least to allow it to continue. And so the trainers uh, would have um, kind of a synchronous training uh, uh, experience with, uh, with all of the youth. And it was a, you know, a, a challenge to make sure that the youth in the class all had access uh, to a computer or uh, a, de a mobile device where they could follow it along. So that was the first. The second was, when did we begin to offer new training? And, and that really was once we kind of had invested in um, digitizing some of our courses. Uh, and so that was um, creating written modules, PowerPoint presentations, and videos um, that would accompany kind of the, the, um, the, the trainers who would go and do a, a live uh, training. So that was probably, took about two months for us to kind of get to the point where we felt confident that we could deliver a quality uh, learning experience to you. You know, I, I think that um, that, is a very logical evolution to get to where you felt you had confidence again in the quality of the training. Even here at Rutgers, such a big place with 71,000 students, uh, many people were a little naive, you know, when it came to the online conversion and said, oh, just put your PowerPoint slides online. And as we all know, that's not how you do it. And quality of education suffers when that happens. So the, the logical steps you took certainly allowed you to remain efficient and remain effective. One uh, student asks a very important question, which is, what if a student doesn't have a computer or a phone? How do you reach out to him or her? Yeah, uh, it's a great question. And the, uh, sadly, the first part of that is that we didn't have a, a plan B. Um, we needed to be able to either direct students to where they could access or, or hopefully um, uh, Find, um, find a device that they could use. Um, and I'll get to the second part to that in a minute, but the, the demographic that we focus on tends to have access, the vast majority do. Where we were running into problems were working with refugees, for example, um, in the Syrian refugee camps in Jordan. Um, that was a, a more difficult uh, reach. So, 
fast forward now, uh, we have um, uh, several of our countries have um, a, uh, a, a set of um, tablets that we can loan to students. Um, and we've had some pretty good success with that. So um, thus far, you know, we didn't know whether we'd hand them out and students would disappear and we'd never see them again. Uh, that has not been the case. Um, so we are accessing students that might otherwise not have the ability. So I, I think it might be helpful. Um, we just have a few minutes remaining then I'll turn it over to Dr. Durbach to thank you and give the commercial for our next uh, session. But I think it might be interesting just a minute or two, Andrew, on what prompted the founder to, uh, to generate the whole concept of EFE and what, how, what drove him, because it's a pretty amazing story. And maybe yeah. you could share a short version of that with us. It is, absolutely. So again, Ron Bruder um, is the founder uh, of EFE um, and uh, is a, um, uh, he describes himself as a serial entrepreneur, but his, uh, his kind of biggest uh, business uh, has been in the real estate development uh, market based in, uh, he's based in New York City. The real estate is, is all over. 9-11, um, uh, his daughter was working in a building next to the World Trade Center. Um. And when it went down, he was unsure whether she had survived. Uh, and didn't know for about 12 hours whether she did. She did, happily. But he literally woke up the next morning and he said, why did this happen? What can I do to, to see that it doesn't happen again? And what's my legacy going to be? I've been so focused on my businesses. What, what am I going to leave behind? And so he set the business aside, handed it over to uh, his number two, who uh, continues to run it to this day, um, and embarked on a two-year journey of discovery throughout the region, meeting with political leaders, uh, civil society leaders, business leaders, um, and came up with this concept with the helping help of the Brookings Institute. Uh, some of you may know the Brookings Institute, a, a, a very prestigious uh, think tank here in, uh, in Washington, DC, um, and came up with this uh, idea uh, of focusing on youth and recognizing this large youth unemployment pro program or problem. And work that he had done in Ireland had kind of attuned him to the fact that when youth are unemployed, that civil unrest typically follows and when do, youth are disenfranchised. And so he felt that one impact would be to provide the opportunity for youth in the, in the region to become employed, um, that that would, uh, would help create more stable uh, societies. And when people have hope and opportunity, uh, a lot can change. So that was, that was his, his story. I think he went in uh, you know, kind of naive, not knowing much about it uh, and has come out as, um, as really one of the drivers in this industry. And, and, and such a remarkable you know, agent of change and, and yeah. so happy that you've taken the reins from him. So I'm going to say my thanks and then give it to our chair, Dr. Durbach. But thank you, Andrew, it was, it's good to see you and it's Great wonderful to see, to see what you're doing. And Dr. Durbach, would you close for us, please? I'm glad that you told uh, something a little bit about Mark Bruder, because I think that that's absolutely correct. You have to begin developing a vision of what you want to leave in your legacy uh, as you get older and uh, as you decide on what you want to do or what you don't want to do. And it's extremely important that that be started when you're rather young. Of course, in some cases, as it happens with uh, Mr. Bruder, it happened when he already had a grown-up daughter. Do you think that he would be interested in just in re 
remaining in the um, Arab and African region, or would he be interested in expanding? And the reason I'm yeah. asking, because all my students, uh, well, not all of them, but most of them are in Ukraine. They're mm -hmm. all very bright. If they need a computer, I get it for them because I want them to participate in uh, situations and events like harasses. Uh, so you think that he may be interesting because Ukraine is a, in my opinion, a per, well, Ukraine, Moldova, um, and Georgia are perfect countries to right. start something because there's so many people there and I know them because some of them help me in my own work and mm -hmm. I have directors there that would be willing to help as long as they have uh, as long as they could affiliate with an organization that actually is doing right. something for the nation and for the uh, people in it rather than uh, for their own pockets. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I'm talking Absolutely. about. Absolutely. Well, yeah, we, our, our door is, is open to, uh, to conversations uh, really to go almost anywhere at, at this point. Um, I think, you know, conditions would need to be right. And, um, and going into a new region like a country like Ukraine, um, there's just a, a bit of a higher bar just because of the language and uh, the materials are adapted towards one culture and they need to be changed a bit. But none of those uh, prohibit uh, that from happening. So uh, finally, I would like to um, mention that our next speaker is going to be Miss Amel Najar who is the founder and executive director of Children for the War Foundation. We will have a Thanksgiving break the following week. And the first week on December, December 2nd, we will have uh, the uh, Katerina Pavlova and Nusrat Lasker talk about the new expansion of nuclear energy and the new nuclear reactors. So thank you very much for being there and we'll see you next week. Thank, thank you, you very much for having me. It's a pleasure. Bye bye. All, you. All right. Oh, wait, I forgot to thank Fred. Fred, I want to thank you very much for all the help that you've been doing and making sure that everything is done just correctly. Thank you. Emerian brother, thank you. Bye-bye. <laughs> thank you.